Good afternoon, everyone. I believe there's a few people remotely as well. So hello. Um, when by well, I, when I met him a few minutes ago, said we do a lot of caching at Google, obviously. Um, but Wenbo wanted me to come and talk here at Google because we do a really different type of caching at, at uh, Terracotta. We do transactional caching, so read-write, read-write caching, um, XA transactions, local transactions, not read-only caching. We do do read-only caching, of course, but but we do much more. So the talk itself is going to is, is going to cover the theory of caching, which is my favourite part. That's that's a good portion of the talk, and then I'm going to do a new and notable. So um, uh, I think EH cache gets used in a few few places here at Google internally, um, and I'm going to actually I'll just get a show of hands. Everybody familiar with EH cache? Yeah. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do in terms of the 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 project because it's an open source project and also a, a Terracotta product. I'm just going to limit that to a few slides on just new and notable features that have happened in the last 18 months. So whatever you knew about EHK in five slides, it'll just bring you up to date in terms of what we've added. Anyway, without further ado, I'll, dump, I'll jump into the essence of caching. So, so firstly, I just want to look at demand and, and how it, like, just to frame the caching problem and look at how we, how we get to caching. Um, and um, in some audiences, a lot of this is news. This may not be news. In fact, I'd be surprised if this is news to this audience. Um, that's, a, that's a real shot um, of, of Puppet Master just showing, just showing spikes in load. So the first thing about load, you don't build an app with an average load in mind. Um, a mean hides a lot of variation. So there's variation. There's variation second to second, minute to minute, as shown by that spiky load graph. If you were to um, if you were to plot the mean, the mean is that green line. So you know, just talking about the mean and capacity planning for the mean doesn't do it. Um, the second thing is that um, in the in Belgium they actually talk about the the elephant curve. Um, that picture comes from a book, The Petty Prince, which a lot of people read. Um, and the top picture is what it looks like if a snake was to swallow an elephant. You just get the outline of the elephant. So it's called the elephant curve. And in Europe, they typically use this to describe the daily pattern of load. And once again, I mean, where would the mean be? The mean would be kind of, you know, just, uh, you know, some way up the body. So you've got those, you know, just like with rogue waves, you know, in terms of your peak load, Mean means a mean doesn't mean much. You've got you've got that daily load, and then you've got spikes within that. So you've got to you've got to factor for much much more than mean. Now you, this one might interest you. This this I got out of um, a recent um, a recent paper. That's um, that's Google Web Search load for one of your data centers, and you can see it's a pretty fair approximation of the elephant curve. Just another aspect of it. Um, my background is in is in hotel, uh, in, is in uh, online hotel. So I was the chief architect at whatif.com, which is where I created EHK, and much of my production experience comes from. And we would have we would have peak days on Mondays. So Monday could be three or four times the normal peak load. And then the other aspect of it is March. So if you look at the if you look at, if you take an annual return for what if and you actually look at sales through the year, you'll see there's a curve that repeats more or less the same shapes at the same times every year. So what would happen, we'd get through one, we'd get through like a, a peak load on a Monday in March, and then we'd kind of spend the next six months thinking about how we were going to get through the same peak that was going to come a year later. And at what if it was growing at, um, it was growing at about 40% per year. So we had to actually um, plan that much more capacity. Now the other thing, and this once again to this audience, this shouldn't, this shouldn't be news. Um, in fact, Google, Google has made a, uh, has done a great job at being, being fast. At, at what if, 
what if we, we had about 15 competitors um, and what we focused on was being available, um, which was partly about planning for the capacity and actually being fast. And the, the, just to take you back to a fundamental piece of research on human computer interfaces, back in the, um, the paper by Miller and Card in um, 68, they looked, at, they looked at attention span and uh, computer response. And 0.1 of a second is the limit for having the user feel the system is reacting instantaneously. And one second is the limit um, before a user's uh, flow of thought gets interrupted. So incredibly important. So just to frame the problem, you've got to cope with those huge variations in demand. You also have to do it. Um, you have to, your whole system really needs to respond in less than a second, ideally. So that's quite a challenge. At the same time, the dream is that your app is horizontally scalable and that it's been designed architecturally so that all you need to do is slide in another rack. And I believe that that is the case with a lot of the Google architectures, but it's far from the case in most of enterprise computing. The other problem, the other problem that you see, or observation, which is setting the scene here, is what I call the hammer and the nail. So um, it's a truism that I kept coming up against. That if you if you have a if you have a, a performance problem and you've got a you've got a meeting room, you've got people sitting around the meeting room, then you'll have a DBA there, and the DBA will say, "Oh yeah, you just need to give me Oracle Rack." You know, this is in an enterprise computing context. Um, or I just need a bigger server. And, and the ops guys will say, yeah, you, you know, I just need to improve the network, I need to do this, I need to do that. The programmers will say, you know, you just need to actually take, take a few of the feature, feature workload off us and actually just give us some time to actually performance tune. Everybody actually is holding a hammer and everybody sees a nail. And, and performance, to get performance, you really need to be holistic. Um, and so you've got to try, try and break through that hammer and nail problem. The, the other one, a favourite one of mine in, in, looking at, um, in looking at performance is Amdahl's law, where to get the speed up of the system is, is that formula there. And what it boils down to in common sense is if you, if you break up your response time into, into segments, each of the different pieces, then if you speed up one of those pieces, you can calculate using this formula what the system speed up will be. And one of the problems with the hammer and the nail interacting with Amdahl's law is if, if say the, I'm a Java guy, if the Java code is, if the Java code is sped up by two, but it was only 2% of the time, say rendering a, rendering a page, um, then, then you're not going to get much of a speed up. You'll get a 1% system speed up. So, I've, done, I've looked at this through lots of enterprise systems, applying Amdahl's law and figuring out where the bottlenecks are. And it's obviously very specific to each system, and what I'd encourage you to do is do the empirical analysis and then apply Amdahl's law to calculate a priori what your system speed up will be from speeding up one of the component parts. However, to generalise, these, the, these are the big four that, that I keep seeing. Um, the first one is the first one is static content. Now, you know this is why content distribution networks exist. At, at what if we we had a 28 second page load time from London with servers in Adelaide, Australia? Um, we rolled our own content distribution network um, and we brought that down to 2.8 seconds. Now. You know, obviously here in the valley, everybody's discovered content distribution networks, but out there in enterprise computing, not everybody has. But that, if you if you apply Amdahl's law, end to end, right to the right to the human end user, usually the usually the biggest win starting out is to actually stick in a CDN. Beyond that, you've got you've got render time, render time, render time of of pages or creation of um, creation of JSON or XML, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. That tends to be quite significant as well. So 
in EH Cache, we actually have EH, a module called EH Cache Web, which allows, um, which allows web caching and has got some interesting properties like um, if multiple threads come in to, to grab, to grab a, a view and the view doesn't yet exist, only one thread, the first thread, will actually go through and actually create it so the other threads are held up so you don't get a, a stampede effect once you have an expiry of a, of a view or the view hasn't been created first. Um, the, the next one is what, what I call collection caching. I don't know if there's a, a good term in the literature for this, but you've done work to assemble a graph of objects and those graph of objects are close to your business logic and they're ready to be used. Um, the, the, the cases tend to be very domain specific, um, but there's, of, there's often very significant work, many database accesses, sometimes web service accesses involved in getting that. So if you can actually cache that data, um, you get a big, a big win. Uh, the next one is anything involving a network access to another service. So it doesn't matter whether it's SOAP, it's SOAP or it's it's REST or, um, in my own experience, um, with, with travel companies, there's all sorts of exotic protocols. Um, um, you've got, with these types of services, in our, um, in our industry, one of the ones that we had to do was from Sydney, we actually had to go to France to actually, um, to Amadeus, to actually do flight searches. So you've got the, I think it's a couple hundred milliseconds round trip best case that you've actually got to add there. So it becomes very, very expensive in terms of time. And then the fourth one, and, and I'm deliberately putting it last because it's the, one, the only one that anyone ever wants to think about is the database. Obviously the database or the data store is expensive, but there's much else. These other things, in terms of the, the benefit you get, in terms of the, if look, applying Amdahl's law, the size of the segment that you accelerate by caching, the, the further out towards the user that you cache, the larger the speed up. You tend to get the slowest speed up benefit um, caching the store, what you get from f the, sometimes, and sometimes the focus is on the database, not because of the speed up you get. The speed up is still quite sig significant. I mean, looking at speed ups, um, speeding, um, step one, so caching web responses, um, you get about a thousand to one speed up. Um, on, the, on the database, you get, you get about a hundred to one. Um, that's the kind of speed up you get, but but on the on the database, often you've got an expensive piece of uh, infrastructure. Often the architecture is not horizontally scalable. Often the architecture cannot be scaled, and what you're doing with caching, more than worrying about speed up, you're actually trying to avoid the cost of an architectural rewrite, and so you're trying to offload the database. That's one of the main reasons why people cache against the database. Now, when I use the term database, I don't just mean database. Um, because we do in-process caching, um, um, we're, we're talking about low, low, micro, low numbers, low single-digit microseconds for access, like EHK standalone. Um, one of the perf tests I do has got 100, 100 threads um, doing a mixed workload of about 75 reads, um, 75 reads and then a balance of, of iterates and, and removes. And the average on that is seven microseconds. Um, the core got reworked in 1.6 um, to, to remove almost all synchronization. The only synchronization I think is on, is on um, there's one synchronization step on put. Um, but it uses, it uses um, it, it, starting off in, in 1.6, it uses um, concurrent hash map and we had to have a separate way of doing, and we, what we do is we use probabilistic eviction, so we don't keep track um, of mutations in terms of um, LRU. Instead, what we do is we actually uh, do a random sample of 15 elements. We actually choose the best. And there's something like 50 or 60 different um, eviction algorithms that you can craft because we have our own metadata. Um, the three that we provide are least, uh, not least recently used because we're probabilistic. So it's less recently used, less frequently used, and, um, and, um, and most recently used. Um, so just to look at just to look at caching, the properties of caching abstractly as a solution to performance. It's got some interesting and unique properties. Um, 
Sure, you get performance. The other thing you get is offload, and it's offload against, against all expensive resources. Now, at Google, at Google on any large dot com, caching, caching is built into the mindset. Everybody realises that you need to cache at multiple levels to actually get the performance. There's an interesting mindset in enterprise developers. Um, majority of enterprise developers that I've come across, including people at my own company, thought that caching was dirty. It was a dirty trick. And, and really, if you engineered things properly, you wouldn't need caching. Um, I don't think that's the case. You get um, offload. So at the same time as you get performance with caching, you also get offload of the expensive resource. And one of the things that seems to, that I've come across that seems to be a truism is almost all new systems start off being engineered monolithically with a single database. And what happens as they grow, if they're successful, they have to get re-architected and re-architected and re-architected. I read somewhere that at Google here, you guys actually re-engineer most of your services about once every two and a half years. So you may yourselves even be going through the same thing. What happens in enterprise computing contexts is that there's usually a vast amount of management resistance to the, to the costs involved in actually completely re-architecting a solution. And so one of, the, one of the big use cases for, for EH Cache is to actually try and delay the re-architecting the system. And, and that's where offload comes in. And doing caching, you can offload pretty much any resource. Um, the, the other thing is scale out. So with, with a distributed cache, you can use the distributed cache to achieve scale out. Now this is a this is a slide from Ars Technica on speed. What I want to do now is just just give you a flavour of the different um, the different speeds of access and how we leverage those. In, uh, and this is something I guess that makes a cache and a distributed cache fundamentally different to something like a NoSQL solution or even something like a mem cache, which is an over the network cache. So if you're looking at your if this is kind of the classic view, IBM have got a new um, have got a new uh, mainframe chip which apparently has set a, a record for speed. I think it's now running over five gigahertz and they've actually got L1, L2, L3 and L4 cache. Um, but this is more typical. The other thing the other thing is is from a RAM point of view, there's often not one set of access speeds for RAM because in your NUMA architectures like your um, AMDs, um, you've, got, you've got daughter cards and you've got crossbar architectures where you get different speeds depending on whether there's locality of, uh, to the memory on the same, um, on the same uh, CPU, um, which, by the way, you can now leverage in Java. There's a switch, there's an XX xx colon use numa switch for actually leveraging that there's the there's the speeds so what's just a just a couple of interesting observations about that is is that uh, is it obviously gets slower down what's not shown in that slide um, is is the network the network is faster than hard disk generally so it also invites another type of architecture where you actually have memory over the network. Now, how do we apply this to, to, uh, to caching? Now, this is uh, EH cache specific, but these similar approaches are true for most of the caches out there. So we have, we have an on-heap store. Um, which is, which is standard Java heap. Um, about two, three months ago, we actually introduced our off heap store. So uh, the, uh, the rattling cutlery is a little bit to get used to, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm getting a little distracted by that. Um, so we have an off heap store, and just like, just like over here, just like over here, the size, the size that you can store um, goes up as the speed goes down. So, so what we do is that we actually leverage our design that way and we say, okay, 
we'll have on heap. On heap's the fastest, right? We just store, it's just objects, and it's basically, um, it, it's just a memory access, and we're using references, resolving references. Um, now, how, how big can that heap go? Now, the question is, now that actually depends on your app. Um, it depends on how many objects there is, what garbage collector you're using, how much time you spend garbage collecting. Um, most people give up and they say too hard and they run their enterprise apps with one or two gig heaps. In fact, we surveyed our customers, two thirds of our customers are actually using 32-bit um, architectures, which means they're limiting themselves to somewhere between two and four gig, depending on their architecture and OS. And so they're not running into garbage collection problems. Um, the largest I've come across is somebody running 80 gigabyte uh, EH case with an 80 gigabyte heap, um, and they suffer 60 second full GC pauses. Now that's a batch application. Obviously, that wouldn't work for online. Getting back to our one second, you know, maximum response time for the whole system. The I have seen. I mean, my rule of thumb is, and what we used at What If was six to eight gigs, and we were able to actually tune that to have no more than um, no more than 100 millisecond full GC pauses. Um, I've seen people get it up to about 12 to 15 gig, but beyond that, that really is the Achilles heel of Java. Um, and and you can't go anymore. Um, so we've got this big memory thing. Big memory is um, is in process, but um, but off heap. It uses um, direct byte buffers, which were actually introduced in Java and way back in 1.4. Uh, we figured out a way to actually make them work really really fast. One of the things that we do is we actually allocate the entire buffer as a slab of memory at startup, um, and it takes takes Java actually about one second for each four gigabytes to actually do that allocation. So what we do is we actually we actually have um, log statements showing your um, showing your uh, direct byte buffers being allocated. Um, we we um, we've performance tested that up to 350 gigabytes and it uh, it scales linearly. So that's big memory, and then we've got local disk. Now, the critical thing about local disk is that local disk is restartable. So what you have in the cache, what you have in the cache when you shut down your app and bring it back, your cache is all there, it's in disk, it loads up from disk, which you can do quite quickly. You can do that much more quickly than it can do a, a web service call or it can do a database lookup. Now the other thing that the other thing that we have below that level is is network. And that's where the terracotta server comes in. And remember what I said about the, the speed of the network, of a fast network, being, being faster than disk access. Um, so it brings in the possibility of being able to actually access a distributed cache where the server pieces are in memory that actually outperforms data stored even locally on disk. Now, so that, that's kind of what our design looks like. Now, in terms, of, in terms of when to use caching and how you know that caching is working, the critical statistic to look at is cache efficiency. So cache efficiency is de defined as, for a given workload, what were the cache hits over the total hits? So if, if a piece of data was, was written once and only read once, then you'll have a cache efficiency of zero. Um, if a piece of data was written once and not read at all, Okay, so a log, you'd also have a cache efficiency of zero. If you've got a piece of reference data, like um, California, state of California, then uh, that's likely to have almost a 100% cache efficiency rate. So, and then in between, in between, you've got, you've got most of the data in your app, your transactional data, and you'll have to calculate what, that, what your cache efficiency is. And depending on what that calculation is, It'll tell you whether it's a worthy candidate to cache or what you have to do to go about improving cache efficiency. Now, high cache efficiency implies high performance because a cache, the cache is much faster than anything else and also implies high resource offload. Now, let's say, let's say that you've got low cache efficiency because you've got transactional data which is really big, and it's bigger than what you can fit in the cache. Obviously, 
if you've got fairly low hit rates on any given piece of data, but you can fit the whole lot in your cache, it doesn't matter. You can still have a high cache efficiency ratio. But generally, that's not the case. And if you go back Back to diagram, you've got your different speeds of access as well. Let's say you just want to use EH cache standalone, which is my understanding of what you guys use here at Google and a few systems, right? You've only got, you've got, you know, you've got limited by heap, um, and let's say your whole data set is a couple of terabytes, and you've got one gig of cache. So you know you've got a 0.5% chance if all data was created equally. But is all data created equally? If all data was created equally, probability of having a, a hit would look like that. That's what your hits would look like. They'd be kind of evenly distributed. But actually, in most e-commerce systems, you get this, you get this, uh, this type of distribution, which is more, is most formally called a Pareto distribution. Um, it's also referred to as a power law distribution. Focusing on the extreme right end, this is what Chris Anderson referred to as the long tail. We're not actually interested in the long tail. What we're interested in is the left-hand side, which is the fat head. Now, what you can do, and what I've done many times, is if you actually get a piece of data that you want to cache, um, and remember we don't care about what it is, right? It could be anything. It could be, could be the, URL, the key could be URLs. It could be, um, it could be primary keys um, uh, in a database. Uh, it could be, it could be a, a web service lookup. It doesn't matter what it is, right? You can just think about it abstractly. What you do is you t look at your production logs right, or you instrument your production logs to get this data out. You produce this curve and then from this curve what you can do is you can say, okay, if, um, as I move along the x-axis, you then calculate the area of the curve that you've covered. And that area of the curve, the area of the curve will give you your cache efficiency ratio. So then what you'll see from the shape of the curve is that you get something like an 80-20 or 90-10. So if you do about 10 to 20 percent of the population, oftentimes that's going to give you 80 or 90 percent. And that's why, that's why caching of only part of the data set works so well so often. Now that's well and good. That's well and good, except these days uh, with EH Cache and Terracotta, we can actually go one better. We can drop in the terracotta server array and we can go up to a couple of terabytes in storage. So you can have a couple of terabytes in your cache. Now, that's not quite big data as understood by people like you, but that's actually more than enough data for most enterprise applications. And so then, then the way this curve looks is a little bit different. There we go. Then, then you end up with one of those curves for each of the tiers in the cache. And so you can use this approach to actually calculate what your performance will be uh, from the cache. Because the cache is fastest off, off on heap, then big memory, then, um, then disk and, and uh, the terracotta server are about, about similar. Now, if, if it was that easy, and read-only caching is that easy, then, then we could all go home. Now, th unfortunately, this is where we leave read-only caching behind and we'll start looking at, 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 at read-write caching, transactional type caching. So how do you deal with the problem that presents itself as soon as you cache with coherency with the system of record? Now, it depends on the business domain and sometimes it doesn't matter is the answer. Sometimes, and, and most times, you can sit down with a business analyst and you can find out that staleness is kind of built into everything we do in life anyway. It's like a timetable. A timetable could be stale. Look at the Google index. What's the average staleness of the Google index? Probably a couple of weeks, except it's not evenly stale. Data that changes more frequently is actually updated more frequently. So this, this, this is normally handled with a TTL, a time to live. But there are actually better patterns for doing a coherency with a system of record. Um, one is the, um, is the eternal. You set your cache elements to be eternal. They never expire, but you capture when they've become stale and you invalidate them. So that's eternal plus invalidation. Um, there's, there's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, 
I mean, EH cache, if you've got a distributed cache and you find, and one of the nodes finds out the data's been updated, you do cache.remove. Um, we have a REST, we have a REST um, API that you can plug in so you can access it from multiple languages. So often what happens is you've got data sitting in a system of record and you've got tons of applications that are working with that data. And so you need to expose some sort of easy web services API to actually do the invalidate. So we've got that too with a, with a REST API. Um, the other one, the other one is the classic Hibernate one. In Hibernate, you set your ca um, you set your cache to be read-write, um, or you set it to be transactional. And what will happen when one of the nodes writes new data, it'll actually invalidate uh, invalidate the the cache. And finally, in the H cache, we've got cache writers. So that's for the write-through pattern. So they're better they're better patterns for dealing with coherency with a system of record. Right, so up to this point, we've just been talking about standalone single nodes. Now, as soon as you get into multiple um, into multiple nodes, you get a new set of problems. Now, why would you want to run an application cluster? Well, the answer is that for anything that matters, you always want to run a cluster because you always have a plus one. You always have whatever the number of servers required to handle the load is, um, plus one. Uh, for redundancy, or you, and there's different, or you might want plus two, or you might want mirroring. There's always more than one server, so you're always running a cluster. And what are the caching problems that that creates? The first one is the end times problem, um, and I'm going to run through these problems. So if we look at, if we look at standalone in-process caching, it looks like that. Um, you've got EH cache, you've got EH cache sitting in your app doing caching. So request, and from here on out, I'm just going to talk about the database as the thing that we cache. But you realise that I mean much more than that by caching. We have four requests that come in. So uh, within the time to live of an element, right, um, each node is doing a request. And then it expires and it'll go back to the system of record. Right? So, so what happens? So n requests are made. So you can generalise this and you can say that when you have a caching cluster that's not distributed, um, you will make n requests to the underlying resource um, within the time to live of each cache element. And that can add up really fast. And this creates a huge problem because you've got your standard enterprise app, it's been built monolithically, and you start scaling it up, you add standalone caching, starts to work really well, you've solved your problem, then you get busier. So what do you do? You add more app servers. Guess what happens? You get this n times problem. Your cache efficiency, cache efficiency stays much the same, but your offload doesn't because the number of requests starts screaming into the streaming into the underlying resource. So what's the solution to that? The solution to that is to create a caching cluster. Now, one thing that, you, uh, that EH Cache has done for about three or three or four years is replicated caching. Now, it's not just EH Cache. Lots of the open source projects actually take this approach. So what you do is you have the entire data set in each node. And when a change is made, um, that change is applied to each of the other nodes. Now, in EH Cache, um, we do that with RMI, uh, J Groups, and JMS, with RMI being by far the most widely applied. Now, there's a couple of problems that, that, that present themselves with this approach. Um, one problem I call the bootstrap problem. So what happens when you restart, restart one of the nodes? Um, I was reading in a paper that, that here at Google, you actually have to restart servers between 1.5 and 16 times per month. Um, and uh, in any long-running application, you're going to be restarting servers. Now, you could have disk persistence turned on, in which case, in which case you partly solve your bootstrap problem because when you restart, the, the thing will come back up. But um, if, it's a, if it's a crash, then your disk, store, um, your disk store will zap itself for protection, so you'll start up empty. So you've got to bootstrap that somehow. Now, uh, in EH Cache, we provide a bootstrap protocol which will copy data from the other nodes. Um, there's another problem as well, though, 
which is the case coherency problem. So whenever there's a change in one of these nodes, there's really a race. It just kind of propagates out to the other nodes like dropping a, a, a pebble in a pond. And um, they could all be doing that. You could be having concurrent updates to the same element um, across the cluster, and they're going to be racing each other around the cluster. What you're most likely to end up with um, is, is, uh, is different versions in different parts of your cluster, which is your classic um, cache coherency problem. And things like memcache, which, which don't use locking, have also got um, a cache coherency problem. Um, although it's slightly different, they don't suffer a bootstrap problem because the data is not stored in the node, it's always remote. Um, you can still have races and you have last one wins with with memcache. So is there is there an answer? So the answer the answer that the the caching industry has come up with, and Terracotta is no exception, is to create a distributed coherent cache. And the implementations vary. The implementation that we have is, is a terracotta server array. We have a coherent protocol um, between the two. The, the, general, the general approach that... I'll give you a general approach, but, but in reality, we are actually very configurable and there's lots of different settings. And in fact, that's true more or less of everyone, that there's, and actually what I'll do is I'll talk about the next problem before I get into that. But we have a coherency protocol that solves the problem. And if you think about it, just, just, to, part, just to give you something to hang on to for right now, um, what we do is we implement the, the happens before of the Java memory model. So, and we do that with locking in the, in the strict case. So that, um, so that to read from the case, you need to acquire a read lock that you can hold on to greedily. If anybody wants to do a write, they acquire a write lock. A write lock is not granted until all the read locks are reclaimed and no more read locks are issued. While the write lock is outstanding, then the, then the write is done and the write is released. There's timeouts and things like that to, to um, deal with partitions. That is, that is uh, EH cache, distributed EH cache's strict coherency mode. I'll get into some other modes that we have in a minute. And the reason we have those other modes is because simply saying that you're going to implement a locking, distributed locking protocol like that is actually not sufficient. It's now well understood um, that, that the CAP theorem is true, so that you can't have all three desirable properties of a distributed system, which is consistency, availability, and tolerance to partition. Now, there's lots of ways of carving up the, the uh, CAP theorem. And um, a, professor at, a professor at Harvard had actually looked at this and actually came up with a, a very interesting observation. And that is there's really two different scenarios for the CAP theorem. Um, the first one, the first one is that, sure, during a partition, you've got to make a decision between what you're going to favour. Is it going to be availability? Uh, it, you can only, uh, is it, it's availability and consistency. You've got to do a trade-off between that. However, you know, what if you don't have a partition? What is happening the rest of the time? Is there a trade-off? It's a different trade-off. The trade-off is actually between latency and consistency. So in other words, um, a strict locking protocol like that um, uh, is not going to work when you have a partition. So you have to choose whether you're actually going to become unavailable or, or, or whether, uh, whether you'll um, allow writes and become inconsistent or allow reads because writes could have happened somewhere else in the cluster. Um, otherwise, otherwise, the trade-off's latency and consistency. The locking adds an overhead and that overhead slows down the operation of the cache. So, so given the CAP theorem, um, what we actually end up with, and in fact what, what all real-world distributed cache implementations end up with, is, is a much finer-grained 
view of the world. So we offer, we offer coherent equals true, which is, which is that full lock mode. We also offer um, a bulk mode load. So what is quite common in a lot of enterprise contexts is that an application can be taken um, offline but still, op still operating um, for maintenance. There might be a maintenance window. And what, what is quite a common use case is wanting to jam a whole heap of extra data into the cache during that maintenance window. So what we, what we have is this, um, is this bulk load mode where you can actually set, set the cache into incoherent mode um, and just slam everything in as quickly as possible on the basis that there, there is no uh, business rights going on to the system. Um, the, other thing that we, the other thing that we do um, is we support um, XA transactions, um, which is even slower than our normal locked mode. Um, and the reason is, is that simply, simply having that type of um, happens before guarantee is, is often not sufficient when you're changing multiple resources. Um, we also introducing in, um, in the next version, which comes out GA in, in a month, um, what we're calling non-strict coherent mode, which is, which is not strictly, there is no strict happens before guarantee, but um, most of the time you'll get your, your um, cache nodes will be updated with changes within four or five milliseconds. And so if you say the CAP theorem is true, then, then you as an application designer really have to make the trade-off. Now what we do is we, we let you decide on a cache-by-cache -cache basis and also with things like the bulk load mode, we let you actually have a setting and then put it into an incoherent mode for a short time and then change it back. And like there's a, there's a wait for coherent, so you can actually wait until the thing becomes coherent again before you continue. So, so we start off at the beginning with the performance problems. Caching is a great solution. However, when, when you end up with full reality, the problems get quite difficult. Um, what you really need to make it work and be useful is a distributed cache, but you have to solve these problems and fundamentally you come up against the cap problems at the end. And as we move through time, we are going to do more and new interesting approaches. One thing that we've just done, which is in the next release, is we've done local transactions. So it's not XA, so it uses a, a resource manager. If you just want to be able to um, apply changes to um, multiple caches within a cache manager within a, a local transaction, then you can do that. And that runs about five times faster than our XA mode. Now I've got um, nine minutes left. I'm just going to very flick, uh, quickly flick through um, uh, what EH cache looks like from a getting started point of view. Um, you have a, the, the master file is a EH cache to XML config file. Uh, standalone typically looks like that. Um, to turn it into distributed, it's the red text there. You just chuck in a terracotta, uh, a terracotta config, couple of terracotta config lines. Um, the kit that you download, um, we comes with both Maven and Ant integration. So there's your commands in Maven to start and stop. You guys are still an Ant shop, aren't you? Or have you moved on to other build tools? Renbo, what, what build tool do you use here? You, didn't, you never went down the Maven path, did you? The, um, from an Ant point of view, we've got um, in the kit, we've got a macro def. It shows you how to get going with Ant or any other build tool. Now, new and notable. I've got a couple of slides on new and notable, and then I'll take questions. So, so EH cache is about seven years. Seven. I must, this must be its eighth year. Uh, it started off as a standalone cache for solving those problems that were that seemed simple to me at the beginning until I kind of fully understood everything to with caching. Um, I joined forces with Terracotta about 18 months ago. Um, what's happened since then is quite interesting. Um, the engineering team size is about 40. Now about 87% of revenue comes from EH Cache, so about 87% of engineering resources go into EH Cache. Um, so there's been a lot going on. We've done, um, we've done six releases and we're actually our seventh will be next month. Um, what is changing 
is it went from that, the early slides that I showed you of EHK standalone and replicated non-coherent into the full enterprise distributed coherent cache. Um, the Terracotta server array, Terracotta um, was a technology for doing, for doing kind of, uh, for, for clustering really, and it had multiple applications. Um, that is all still true of Terracotta, however, a huge amount of work's gone on to actually re-engineering the core to make it be a very, very good um, across-the-network um, cache store. And it pretty much gets, gets rejigged every time we do a release. Um, just to give you a, a, little bit of, a little bit of a taste of what's been going on, so I said that on heap, about six gig was about your limit. Um, now, in a distributed cache, we can take that up to about two terabytes. Um, with it, with, uh, in terms of your in-process cache size, um, we can take that up to about one terabyte. So if you have a, um, if you actually have enough memory, and you can buy machines from HP and, and Dell uh, and Oracle uh, with two terabytes of memory in them. So you can actually have a Java process uh, with one terabyte, and you can have, a, you can have one terabyte of cache, um, which you can do a lot with. It's interesting when you start talking to giant dot coms. Um, there's a big social network, and they have their entire address book uh, of, of people in, um, in EH cache. They've got 40 gigabytes in EH cache, and they put up with the GC pauses. I'm not sure how they, how they cope with that. But that's an example of like, where something like big memory would eat that up. Um, performance has been improved by multiples, and we're getting more and more into the fine-grained trade-offs, um, as well as doing really hard stuff like making um, two-phase commit work properly. The other thing that's interesting, we, we see ourselves as being distinct and separate from, the, from NoSQL because NoSQL is always across the network and it's, and, uh, it's always a, a durable store. It gets a little bit blurred. Um, we have people using us for NoSQL use cases. So I'm not going to say we're a NoSQL solution, but Terracotta, the Terracotta cache um, can be set to be persistent um, and we're also schemaless. We have... Obviously, we are key value, get put, and um, in the new version that comes out in a month, we've actually added an object-oriented search API. And the, the performance characteristics of the search API um, are big o, big o log n divided by the number of shards. So it's indexed, but it has the property of a, as, you, as the cache grows and you add more and more servers, that your performance remains the same. So it's been a pretty interesting been a pretty interesting ride, I can tell you. Um, just to whiz through a few of the features in detail, um, there's the fine-grained cap trade-offs. Um, another one that's interesting that we added was some CAS methods. So even when you have, even when you've set your cache cluster to be incoherent, you can actually still get, um, you can still get coherent methods put if absent and replace using CAS style operations. It's not always going to work. Um, it'll return false if it fails to update. Um, from a management point of view, um, we've actually uh, created an EH cache monitor, which is a GUI monitor, which makes it much easier to visualise those types of graphs I was telling you about when, doing, when looking at cache efficiency and tuning. There's something like 15, about 15 or 20 statistics that you can look at, um, with cache efficiency being the main one. And there's also the Terracotta Dev Console. Hibernate. Um, EHK has always been used with Hibernate. Um, we completely reworked that and adopted the Hibernate 3.3 plus um, SPI. Those guys did a pretty good job. Um, the, the maximum speed that a cache could run at um, when used by Hibernate was actually limited by Hibernate, not by the cache, because Hibernate actually used synchronised everywhere. 3.3 plus, they actually um, got rid of that and they actually um, moved thread safety to the cache where it should have been all along. So we've got a whole new implementation that does that. Um, we also support, for the first time, we actually support all of the Hibernate features. It's, it's kind of amazing, given the number of people have used DH cache with Hibernate over the years, but we only ever supported a subset of, of Hibernate strategies. Now, now we support all of them, including, but most importantly, transactional. Uh, JTA, as I said, we did. Now, when you're using us transactionally, it's, um, let's say, read uncommitted. That should say read committed semantics. It's read committed semantics, is other semantics that you get. Um, we do write behind when, when your data store or database is struggling to keep up with writes. Uh, we do bulk loading, that bulk, special bulk loading mode I talked about. 
where there's absolutely no coherency or no, no effort at coherency or HA, it's about 10 times faster. Uh, we've got search. Uh, I've spent a lot of time over the last few months designing this. It's, it kind of nods to the Hibernate criteria um, API, which I always liked, um, but it's definitely its own thing. And it's definitely very unlike a query language for a database because caches are different and we have metadata. Um, you can search by key, obviously. You can search by value. Um, you can also extract, extract fields and call methods in the values and actually index those. Um, so it's a full search. Um, we do text searching, all sorts of things. It's quite a powerful language. You can create, um, you can create um, really any level of complexity um, in the query. Um, in terms of what we return, we either return keys, a key set, or we return the values, or, we, or there's a whole stack of built-in aggregators, um, so you can just return the aggregator. So, so really what you can do with search is you can probably replace potentially thousands or tens of thousands of cache operations with a single query, depending on what your, your, uh, your business logic is. I mean, a really great example, there's a, a worldwide logistics company and they generate 400 gigabytes of data um, of consignment notes every two weeks. Now, they need to, they, people need to be able to search for the consignment note. Um, they don't know the ID. Often, to, who knows the ID, right? Um, so um, it turns out that 98% of searches are for the last two weeks. So if you could actually put, and they've they got a database that's dying under the search load. So if you can actually take take 400 gigabytes of data, stick that in the Terracotta server array, it's all indexed, and then it's only the 2% that you miss that where you go over to the um, over to the database. So that's a really good use case for search. Um, the other one is big memory. By the way, in case you were wondering, um, that command line is the is the command line that you need to add when you want to allocate um, off-heap memory in the JVM. And that, that switch works for um, all of the different JVM implementations, which is actually nice given that it's a minus XX. It's actually at the moment the same. And we've tested all of them. Um, now, um, for the slides that get up uploaded, um, there's, there's, um, I've actually got um, applied areas that actually show you, that work through uh, web caching, database caching, and what I call general purpose caching, which is using the cache API directly. Um, it just shows you how to work through those and do those. I'm not going to cover those now. Um, instead, I'm just going to whiz right to the end and take questions. Um, there's the further information. You can follow me on, um, on Twitter or you can follow EH Cache on Twitter for uh, announcements. Um, there's the docs. Um, like a lot of open source people, I consider the documentation and the Java doc and the code all one thing. So I actually write all of the EH Cache docs myself and uh, that they, they are representative of my understanding of how it works. Um, so. Hopefully, um, most people consider the documentation pretty good. We're doing a lot of work over the next couple of weeks to uh, go through and update all the docs for all the new features coming in 2.5, sorry, 2.4. Okay, so Renbo, are there any questions coming in? Beg your pardon? Uh, does the remote sensor have any question? Yeah, I guess uh, so. You know, if you're interested, you can stay here There's after the talk. There's a question that gentleman there. Okay, so the question is: Is is it open source? Uh, so EH Cache is is the Apache 2 license. Um, Terracotta Server Single Node is the Terracotta Public License, um, which is which is an open source license. So what you download from SourceForge is open source. If you want to scale out, you have to buy a commercial version of Terracotta. And there's some features like big memory that are not included in the open source. 
but transactions and probably about 90, 95% of features are in the open source. So it's under the covers, um, under the covers in the Terracotta server, it's actually powered by Lucene Index. So it's more about the convenience of being able to search the cache. Because often being, often, if all you have is a key, but you need to be able to search the cache, then you really can't, what are you going to do? You're going to go and build a separate Lucene Index on the side. It's, it it kind of makes sense. There's so many use cases where people need more than just the key. Um, and uh, it's Lucene at the moment. Um, using Lucene as the implementation is not without its difficulties in terms of integrating it in the Terracotta server. So it may, the underlying implementation may change. Um, the thing that will remain stable and will get added to is, is the API. But it's, um, from a performance point of view, um, it, works, it works much the same at the moment. It works much the same speed as Lucene, except that the key space is distributed over the different, um, the Terracotta server array there's, it's the, the, uh, the cache is partitioned um, where the, the partition size is, is, the, is the total cache divided by the number of servers. So if you've got 10 servers, 10 active servers, you've got 10 partitions. So search is done using scatter gather. So we fire out the request, the search is done. For some things like the, um, the, uh, the aggregators, then we return partial results um, and they're put together once it's gathered back in. But for other things, um, other things, we just sum the results together and pass them back. So it's, it's, uh, I'm pretty excited by it, actually. I mean, I think um, O log n divided by number of partitions is pretty, pretty nice performance. And it's got that special characteristic of true linear scalability. And that's what really excites me. Standalone, what we're doing for standalone, it's exactly the same API, but standalone Standalone, we're just doing brute force table scans. So people typically don't like using EHK's disk store because it's something else to worry about. And, and so it turns out that the cache itself is so fast that up to a moderately sized cache, and we'll have to figure out exactly where that limit is, like 10,000 or 100,000 elements, you can actually search just using brute force. Um, but but anything large at all, um, it's only practical with the, um, the, the server array. We're looking into the possibility of actually um, creating indexed for standalone as well, but I'm just not sure whether people would actually like that idea. It's, there's a lot to go wrong, you know what I mean? Like you get a corruption, you've got to rebuild your index, you're doing a lot of work really in, in, an app, in what for most people they expect is their application server node, not a, not a database node or not a solar node. Thank <laughs> you.